Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce our four readers this evening. We have Dr. Romola Parrish, Humphrey Astley, Laura Tice, and Mary Jane Holmes. And the first of our readers will be Romola. She is an environmental lawyer and academic. She was poet in residence at Oxfordshire County Council's Historic Landscape Project. She won the Edward Thomas Fellowship Prize in 2017 and was shortlisted for the Walter Swan Poetry Prize and the Winchester Poetry Festival Prize in 2016. Her work has been published in The Lamp, The Irish Literary Review, Snakeskin, Planet and The Cardiff Review. Um, when I was poet in residence at Oxford County Council, you wouldn't think of a government department as having a poet in residence. Um, but it came out of a conversation that I had with the archaeologist who was responsible for creating a digital map, which you can all see, um, of the history of the landscape of Oxfordshire. Um, and out of that grew a collection of poems about uh, this new world that she created um, based on this map, which I called Polygonia, which for reasons which will become clear. Um, the first three poems that I'm going to read are, um, I'll read without, um, so one follows the other. The first is about the map, the creation of the map itself. The second is um, about the person, Abby Tompkins, who created the map, or was responsible for creating the map. And then the third poem is about navigating the map, navigating the landscape in its defamiliarized form, and then just a couple of other poems from the collection. So the first three poems then are about uh, map making, which is not as dry as it sounds. <laughs> the legend of Polygonia. It came to pass that the queen decided to register her land. Each unit according to its past and its present usage. And so she went about her land with her civil servants and she recorded the land and all the things that she could see and all the things that she could discover about her land. And she divided the land into polygons, each according to its kind and assigned to each kind a unique reference, beginning with H-O-X. And she recorded all these polygons upon a map that covered the whole of her queendom. And for each kind of polygon, she gave a colour or a shade of a colour, with or without stipples or hatching. So each kind of polygon could be easily identified. And she created 109 different kinds of polygons. And she brought together into one place all the colours and the shades of the colours and the stippled and hatched markings and placed this gathering of identities alongside the map that she and her civil servants had made and thus was created the legend of Polygonia. The Queen of Polygonia, and this is dedicated to Abby. She is all powerful. At the touch of a button, she renders all her territory into abstract polygons. The streets we travel, the pubs and shops we visit, the fields we walk, the buildings we occupy, and the scarps and valleys, the quarries and bridges, stations and roundabouts by which we navigate are reverse engineered from four dimensions onto a flat sheet, turning the white blanks of the OS map into bright cells. And for each cell, she weighs the values of its attributes, stretches the sources of the past to interlock through time and space, holds in balance the then and the now, and fills them one by one with a condensate of centuries, rich and fecund 
as the DNA of honey. Navigating Polygonia. My points of reference have changed. Instead of plotting progress by sunset-coloured roads, water of a predictable blue, and a single green with three variables of annotation set upon a white backdrop, I leap across a wordless landscape, keystrokes flipping from screen to screen, century to century, making forest green recede and cower in the face of the encroaching tide of tangerine fields, eaten away in their turn by bruise purple, plague red, towns and villages. I am giddied by my flight, all strapped to my seat, and when I arrive back in my own time, I have to step back onto the cool earth, set my feet one by one across the land to reconnect, reorientate, and plot the moment when I cross the boundary from one polygon to the next. And then I'm going to read a couple of poems which are um, about some of the places around uh, that I, was, I looked at um, the maps in detail for an area which is about five miles in circumference from the village that I live in, which is Stonesfield, just uh, north of Woodstock. And each poem in the collection has uh, the Hox number. If you remember the first poem, it, it's the, they were each polygon is given a Hox reference, I mean, historic Oxfordshire. So if you go onto the digital map and look up the Hox reference, you can find exactly which bit of Oxfordshire the poem is actually written about. And the, I'm going to read just two of these. And the first one is called Stuntersfeld which is uh, the name by which Stonesfield is known in Doomsday Book. Um, and one thing you need to know is uh, Stonesfield, an area where they used to quarry the oolitic limestone that came out like slate, and it used to cleave into flat plates that you could use for roofing. So um, that's a little bit of detail that might help understanding what's going on here. So Stuntisfeld. You would have thought it was named for its oolite, quarried since Roman times. But Stonesfield's name in Doomsday Book is the Field of the Foolish One. It counts the sleeping furlongs of woodland, ploughs, slaves and villains granted to Aelfric the Saxon by the conquering Norman king. Aelfric leased it to Robert of Stafford at 30 shillings a year, but neither mentions the quarries or the limestone slate found there. The workings are silenced and hidden, returned to the brambled earth, and the Jurassic dinosaur they found is beached in a museum berth. The church bells ring on a Sunday and sleep for the rest of the week, but once they rang when the frost came, and then you would have seen the quarrymen roused from their firesides, deturfing the damp slate stacks, exposing the rough hewn edges to let the ice open the cracks. You can still see the roofs that they furnished, mellow and weather tight, but now there is no way of knowing who the fool, where the field, why the foolish. And the final poem is, um, is a more dreamlike quality. It's, it's touching on some of those aspects of landscape that you sense but can't see. And it's called Eidolon, which uh, is a Greek word which not only means idol or something that's perfection that you might aspire to, but it also means a sort of phantasmic apparition. Eidolon. He came from Scotland, where it's called Drich. She from the land of Tarth and the Brennan Fluid. But in this in-between place, I don't have a word or a myth 
for a day when the fine mist is not fog or murk or haze, but too heavy for the air, it banks up behind the belt of trees, filters through the firebreak to mingle with the river's breath. And the sheep-bitten turf pulls the damp over itself, and my skin is cold with moisture. And in the half-light, a mink slinks soundless under the belly of the cloud at the interface of earth and sky, pauses, not quite close enough to touch, turns its sharp face to mine, stares with my father's penetrating gaze, its pelt the colour of my mother's hair, beaded with prisms, casting pearls into grey, then fades, leaving musk wraithed in the chill and the formless whiteness and the bones of the trees leaning into the absence. Thank you. Our next reader is Humphrey Astley. He is a poet and musician based in Oxford. His works include the three-part album and stage show, Alexander the Great, a folk operetta, and the pamphlet, The Gallows, Mel the Gallows Humoured Melody. His poetry has appeared in Agenda and Other Poems, Disclaimer and The Punch, and he has a new pamphlet forthcoming titled The One-Sided Coin. <clears throat> that was very brief, and I'm now concerned that my poems are too long. So stop me if they're too long. Uh, yeah, I'm Humphrey. Um, this is a piece I recently had published in a magazine called uh, The Punch. And it's called A Spotlight. I wake up with my cheek against a wooden floor. It's dark, but somehow I'm aware of being cradled in a space within a larger space. Yes, these must be the walls of whatever box or basin I'm in, looming out of the gloom. Very carefully, I lift my head up, then my shoulders, noticing the damp as it peels away from me. The basin rocks a little. It's a boat. I'm in a boat. But am I moving? Nothing in my pockets. Lighter gone. I run my hands along the sides and seem to find the corners of a stern, then look over the edge and focus hard, but can't be sure if what I'm seeing are ripples in my wake or imperfections in my vision. Where am I? I ask, feeling like an idiot for saying it out loud. Just then, the space behind me lights up and I turn to see a sheer expanse of white noise, and at the bow, a spotlight with its back to me. A spotlight? A figure? A person? Petrified, I cannot look away. Slow as ice, it turns its head and looks at me the empty face of the moon. Okay. Uh, I have this pamphlet that I published with Albion Beatnik Press, the local one out of the bookstore. Um, they understand they're closing down, which is a real shame. Or have they already closed down? I don't know. It's done, is it? Okay. So you cannot go and get my book from there. 
uh, and I only have a couple of copies left. Um, I think there are some in Blackwell's, because I did a reading there last year and, and dumped a bunch of copies, if you're interested. Um, I'm going to read a piece called uh, Louisiana Rondeau. Um, and it's about a girl I met in New Orleans. Um, and I chose the, the Rondo is like an old French form. It's a bit like a sonnet in um, size and structure, but it has um, a, a three part refrain. And so I figured if you're going to write a poem um, about New Orleans and you want to capture like the Cajun vibe, then like a French form might be the one to go for. And apparently like some old like blues men used to like adapt Rondo into blues songs. So it seems to work. Louisiana Rondo. With flashing neon fleur-de-lis, which at the time were new to me, you waited at the pizza place. At seven bucks an hour, your face was lit up, lit up, barely twenty. You led me open-handedly through streets that guzzled history and gifted me your drifter's pace, past flashing neon fleur-de-lis. Today I check my feed to see the talk of how they found your body. Always was a schizo case, poor thing, and there but for the grace you come and go with say la vie, with flashing neon fleur de lis. This is. How am I doing for time? Uh, this is quite. This is a fairly long narrative piece. Um, from the pamphlet I'm about to publish called The One-Sided Coin, um, which is mainly like one long like dramatic monologue, but interspersed with vignettes. And this is one of those vignettes, and the whole thing has quite a sort of um, dystopian vibe to it. Um, though this piece is actually based on real observations made by scientists in um, Svalbard in Norway um, in 2015. Um, should I spoil it? I'm never sure if I should. I won't. Um, anyway, <clears throat> it's called Bear and Fish. We knew something was wrong. Because the ice was a red we hadn't seen before, and the bear was out of breath. It stopped us in our tracks. Picture turning a street corner and coming face to face with a stray dog the size of a gas guzzler. Something spooked her, though, and we watched her outline fly like a dog-eared white flag into the no-man's land of quicksilvered wastes, which Dievik liked to call the thawed horsemen. We knew something was wrong because on our approach, the kill took on a shape and size we couldn't place. This was not the corpse of recorded polar prey, unless the bear had mauled it beyond recognition. The flayed, stretched rictus. A dolphin, someone said. And sure enough it was. He must have ventured north when he felt the waters warming, opening, and come up for air at this blinding hole in the ice. 
We photographed the scene and left the bear to its meal. We knew something was wrong because nobody spoke on the way back. And it was a while before we recalled the dolphin's outsized brain expanding through the cleft in its skull as it froze. How it sparkled like ore. So yeah, if you want to see some pictures of a polar bear eating a dolphin, um, just Google it. Some quite extraordinary images. Um, how am I for time? One, one, one more? I'll do another one from the Gallows Humid Melody. Um, here's a nice, another sentimental one for you. Um, this was published a couple of years ago in um, Agenda magazine. So it's online somewhere. Uh, and it's called Mirrors. <clears throat> We're getting to that age now when our parents will retire into stories. I'll never forget your barn owl of an old man in the armchair facing the lottery of an illness that replaced him from the bare feet up. He seemed to own his lot the way only the middle-aged can, with bad moods for barns. And when they loomed like too much information, we'd return to the untidy room across the hall where I learned to play the bass by playing along to Hendrix songs. He died a legend at 27, younger than we are. Does this mean some chance has passed us by? It means some other chance is yet to pass. We resonate when glancing off the mirrors in our paths. And by the time our children have learned to write this poem, we may have grown apart. But when we get to the age that makes its mark in stone, our bodies will ungrow into a broader kind of being. And they'll speak to each other at the level life drowns out. Our next reader is Laura Thais. Laura is the recipient of the 2017 AM Heath Prize. She was nominated for the Tassilo Award twice and was artist in residence at Fenix Theatre Antwerp. Her short stories, songs, radio plays and poetry have been broadcast and published in the UK, Germany and the US. Her new work is forthcoming in Strange Horizons, Dime Show Review, A Bite Place Journal, Three Drops Press, and Enchanted Conversations. Um, so this is a poem called Medusa. Do not lose faith on the day you wake up with spiders instead of hair. Do not cry as you look in the mirror. Remember, they may stay, they may not, they are here for now. If you must take pains to cover your head, hide their crawling under your most elegant hat, lest people recoil from you in the streets, or don't. Remember Medusa and her snakes. She'd turn anyone to stone if they looked at her frightened. She was a monster and proud, all hiss, curse and scorn, danger. And yet to think someone must have loved her enough to name half of all jellyfish, those moon-glowing blooms of floating fluorescent umbrellas and bells, after her.
Uh, the next poem is uh, called Storm Petrol, and um, a couple of poets were asked to pick an object from the Pitt Rivers Museum and then uh, write poems about them and perform them in the museum. And the object I picked was a, a little bird that had been turned into a candle by sailors. And um, yeah, that's Storm Petrol. Pitt Rivers Museum, case 29A. Oh, take your pity elsewhere, landlocked stranger. I am still waiting to burn. Yes, I was the sole bird of a dozen drowned sailors, was wave walker, weather vane, Black Mary's chiclet, harbinger of stormy seas, phalatic stowaway. They feared me, called me Satanita, water witch. I was meant to end at the hand of men who know that one tarred string is enough to tell the bird from the candle the witch from the flame. But take your sad eyes elsewhere, stranger, listen. One day, the storm will find me, and I'll blaze. Uh, the next one's called An Unexpected Fondness. And I wrote it for uh, the course where we had to write a poem about unexpectedness. So that, that's what I <laughs> came up with. I am in your house, the one I always envied you for. All that space, so much space, flooded with light and so clean. Blue shutters on the windows and that apple tree with a tiny wood bench. The gardening gloves, the barbecue, the blender, the BMW, the kitchen aid with the pasta extension. Everything exists twice, one in full size and one in miniature for the kids. And now it is late. So late it is early, yet I am not sleeping. I am stuffing my face with the muesli you keep in a glass jar with a small silver shovel like they do in magazines. Maybe I cannot sleep because somehow this house is filled with all of your waking nights, your quiet, smiling fights, your infinite patience with the sorrow, the horror you never speak of. Maybe, or maybe I'm making this up. Maybe that was just me being hungry. But upon returning to my own shoebox room that contains nothing worth more than a fiver, a year's worth of dust and some mold, I surprise myself by suddenly loving it. And this is a poem called The Color of the Witch. I have yet to see an ugly tree. It is not even your line, but he smiles, lips curled around his silence as they sometimes curve around his vowels. You can tell even though he is walking ahead, because he's holding your hand. Stay away from the boy, they'd said. We hear that emerald's his favorite color. Keep away from the boy, they'd said, for willows are his favorite trees. And it is true that his words are like falling through forest floor his voice like the soft ground you wish to be buried in. Other men have tried to gain your heart with cash or song or poetry. All it took for him to break you was what? One glance through his colorless lashes, one shrug, half a name. Stay away from the boy, they'd said. Emerald's his favorite color. Keep away from the boy, they'd said, for willows are his favorite trees. And it is true that after the first time he kissed you, he left you alone in a clearing, and when he stood there, fist raised against the sky, a sparrow hawk shot down to land on your hand, gave you a long, inscrutable stare, then flew off again. Your mother noticed you shaking at dinner that night. Stay away from the boy, they'd said. Emerald's his favorite color. Keep away from the boy, they'd said. Willows are his favorite trees. And it is true that all night grows heavier, darker around him. The wind louder, its song more pronounced. And that after the first time you murmured, I love you, and left you half naked and giddy behind the woodshed, you found you were suddenly able to dictate the movements of clouds with your mind. Stay away from the boy, they'd said. Emerald's his favorite color. Keep away from the boy, they'd said. Willows are his favorite trees. And while their warning words are nothing to you, it is also true 
that his beautiful fingers are curled around the seeds of all sorrow, all sadness, all pain, not just yours or his, everyone's. He might plant a new seedling every once in a while, but for now, he's only walking ahead. For now, he's holding your hand. Okay, and... And I have a really little one for the last one. It's called What They Left Behind. I returned to find a dirty sock, two coffee rings on the table, a pair of snow lilies sweltering on the windowsill, an orange peel by the sink, and so many biscuit crumbs in my bed that I almost fancy myself inside a sand flaked seaside cottage and start to dream of ocean spray. Thank you. Next we have Mary Jane Holmes. Mary Jane is uh, editor of Fish Publishing Ireland. She is the winner of the 2017 Bridport Poetry Prize, the Martin Starkey Poetry Prize, the Bedford International Poetry Prize, and the Drummondier Fiction Prize. Her debut poetry collection, Heliotrope with Matches a Magnifying Glass, was published in April. Dave Lorden has described Mary Jane as perhaps the most convincingly rural and at the same time convincingly contemporary English poet since Ted Hughes. She has been published in Mislexia, the Journal of Compressed Creative Arts, Prole, the Tishman Review, The Lonely Crowd and the Best Small Fictions Anthology 2016 and 2018. Siren call. No. Shh. Listen. Not the gulls, their car alarm cries, or the waltzer's grease of screams, nor the crunch slide of the slot machines, the claw crane snap of near misses, nor the busker's squeeze of his squeeze box, or the brags of city lads and blow-ins buoyed on snake bite and black, tongues lashed like a riptide. No, not even the familiar sounds, your father unsheathing his knives to gut and fillet the weak's catch, your mother's loud silence when his key isn't heard, circling the latch. No, there, amongst the clang of masts, strung from piling to cleat, yes, the rope its twist and creak, its tug tugging, the moon's call to slip the knot from the small town that holds it to drift. Many of the poems in this collection are um, centered around the North Pennines, which is where I live at the moment, and which is happily overshadowed by the lakes, so we don't get any tourists where we are. And this next poem comes from letters gathered from um, miners who went over to the, the New World. Um, and it's sort of a, a collage of, of those letters back to their wives. It's called Letter from a Mercury Prospector to His Wife in the Durham Dales, 1904. If you could see me in my bandana, my blue drill breeches, seams riveted against the jut of schist and tufa, my bracken skin. I fear you would not know the man you waved across the water some six months since. Today we worked a new vein, the cinnabar ruddy below land that rounds like our own bald moors and fells, but lies so bleached and ridged with heat, the ground has no given it. The becks and burns hold no moisture. For this I've no need for vests nor filibegs, but thank you, and I retain the coat of good gabardine you made me, for the air blows as mean as any helm wind over Eden. And although the cloth has frayed, the stitches thinned, we pulled fifty flasks of ore this last month in, and I have hired a girl called Argentina, who darns, keeps house and cooks, and when the quicksilver works brisk off the smelter, sublimes the air, 
She steams black brush and mint to allay the fever, makes oatmeal mash for my loosened teeth as we sit and watch the clouds. She tells me then, when I am better, to send for you. And I say, of course I will, my love, of course I will. Um, right. Slightly um, different theme, but in, in uh, conjunction a little bit with uh, Laura's um, emerald loving boy. Disciplining the modern satyr. This came from um, the O'Beale's five word anthology competition where you, they, you're given five words and you have to um, put them into a poem. Ignore the fawning, the castanets, the way he calls you little witch and lifts your skirts with the tip of his nose, grab it. Take the head of a live trout, put it in his mouth, let him breathe the air engendered there, or take a shrew mouse, make a holocaust of it, serve it up as a curative dose, don't let him talk you out of it, don't confuse the soft suede of his chest with the sound of jenny wrens building nests, do what your mother did your grandmothers, take him to a tanner's yard, hold him over the pit while the hides are turning, tie an amethyst around his neck to dull the gleam in his eyes. If all else fails, lock the doors, make sure he swallows the key. The road I live on in the North Pennines is the only road in that dale. It's called the B6276. B6276. Nothing still. Even the dead are on the move. Trap sprung, wind snapped. The hills shake sun from lambs' backs and forth the flip side of kestrels. Don't be fooled by this road's thin drawl, its skin's smooth rhetoric, dreaming the perfect destination. Here, there, are hidden dips. Observe the hash of roadkill casting off its camber of flies, flexed. Follow its logical conclusion, past lintels of sycamore, shake holes, slippings of peat. Past the chapel of ease, the quarry, its mouth a vowel of scars. Until you find yourself at sky's open doorway, where words like wait and hope are one and the same to the hollow tree shouldering the horizon. And finally, extinction. Every day I climb the swerve of the hill, past the neighbour who chased me moons ago with a filleting knife, past the Barbary fig where old bachelors bring their rifles on those spring nights they miss their mothers. Here, strays linger, so I pick a stone from the path, then up, up into the business of almonds, the odd olive, past the unkempt mule keeping time with the harvest of church bells, up, up to the fizz of the pylon that carries its burden from this valley to the next, sounding like an ocean, sounding like an ocean that every day reminds me of Stella's sea cow grazing on Bering Island unaware its fat is as yellow as the best Dutch butter, its meat like sirloin. It masticates the shore, not in the least afraid of sailors, the harpoon, clouds, shoal. I hear the dogs below, feel the rocks weight in my palm. From this far up, the neighbour salting his catch is so small. I gather windfall, husk split, watch women herd children to school, no, I am a fool. Okay, well, welcome everybody to Kellogg College, uh, including all those alumni who are coming back. I hope not for the first time and not for the last time. It's lovely to see you. Um, so we have today a poetry reading, as you've seen, by some excellent re um, graduates of the Creative Writing Programme. Delighted to have you all here. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce Catherine Higgins-Moore. 
who is a Northern Irish writer based in New York. She writes for the Times Literary Supplement and is founding editor of the Irish Literary Review. Catherine is a journalist who has worked in the newsrooms of BBC Oxford and BBC Belfast. She holds master's degrees from Trinity College Dublin and the University of Oxford. She has been shortlisted for New York's Penn Parentis Fellowship, the Ted Hughes Elmit Trust Award, the Canterbury Festival Poet of the Year, the H.G. Wells Grand Prize, the Oxford Brooks International Poetry Award, Cambridge University's Jane Martin Girton College Poetry Prize, the Bath Short Story Prize and the Ashen Award. She has re recently been signed by Alice Lutyens at Curtis Brown. Her writing has been published in The Gathering, Prole, Embers of Words, an Irish Anthology of Migrant Poetry, in American journal Northern Liberties Review, alongside writers Maya Angelou, Seamus Heaney, John Betjamin and Bob Dylan in Heart Shoots, The Charwell, The Honest Ulsterman, The Ob Lobster's Run, Free, Narrative Magazine and The Stinging Fly. Catherine's play, Just Two People, was produced at the Oxford Playhouse's Burton Taylor Studio in 2010. She was offered one of eight places on Columbia University's MFA in playwriting, where Columbia's course director, playwright Charles Mee, said of the intake, We admitted a class of unusually bright, talented, interesting, surprising, risk-taking students. And among them, Catherine is a standout. She is a remarkably smart, gifted, adventurous writer. Her work is outstanding, strikingly original and fresh, beautifully crafted, startlingly accomplished. Catherine has been awarded bursaries by Kenneth Branagh and Kellogg College. She will be reading from her poetry collection, Strange Roof, which was published in the US by Finishing Line Press as part of their New Women's Voices series. Her work has garnered praise from writer Daniel McLaughlin, Danielle McLaughlin, author of Dinosaurs on Other Planets. From The New Yorker, who said, Strange Roof is a collection that delivers exquisite explorations of distance, loneliness, and the constant tug of home. It also delineates with grace and ferocity the price that life exacts from women, the scars it inflicts, physical scars and psychological ones. And from Lisa O'Donnell, author of The Death of Bees and winner of the 2013 Commonwealth Book Prize, who said, Catherine Higgins Moore's use of language is embold uh, to embolden and communicate experience inspires and excites. She is not afraid of anything. Her confident, gritty flair inks life into a world both known and unknown. A joy resides in these pages, a bold and fearless joy. Catherine. The uh, first poem I'd like to read this evening is called Balconies. And um, some things you might want to know before I read it is that there is a visa called a J1 visa that a lot of Irish students um, use in the summer holidays um, during their university days to go over to the US and work for four months. Now, I believe that it has become more difficult recently and that you need a job lined up in advance before you go, but it used to be the case that you got your visa in sort of March and you went over from June until September or October. It was very exciting and it was just a, a wonderful time for most people that did it. Um, and in 2015, six people died in Berkeley when a, a balcony collapsed um, and, and five of those people were Irish third level education students. And I believe one was American. Several more were injured. <coughs> Balconies. Those children of Ireland went to America seeking the pleasure and promise we are reared expecting. Never from our own strict mothers serving square meals, dousing suitcases in holy water, but from the east and west coasts of the land of our dreams. We knew America. It was as familiar and foreign as a best friend's bedroom. We never feared it. California was a movie, a Saturday evening show where the girls were button-nosed blondes called Kelly, the boys commanded surfboards, drove Porsches, scandalized fathers. How we wanted to be like them, taking trips to Palm Springs, limos to winter dances and spring flings. America meant bigger, brighter things. Those six were all of us that ever waved goodbye at Dublin airport, fathers lifting suitcases to be weighed. They were all of us who couldn't keep the shriek from our voices nor the grins off our faces. They were all of us who queued for J1s, planning and plotting a summer to remember, their parents ours, 
holding tight, trying to keep us forever, hoping and praying they had raised us streetwise as well as clever. Young, bright, happy, never suspecting, never expecting in such heat, in such mundane pleasure, another balmy shattuck night would, in a second, steal their light. Cold comfort to say they went together. And the next two poems I'm going to read are um, sort of two different stages of a romantic love, an earlier one and um, a slightly later one. So the first is called Trinity Ball. A bleary-eyed young couple walked 3.5 miles from Front Arch to Palmerston Park. Her, in last night's chiffon frock, protected from the fresh wind by an oversized tuxedo jacket, silver high heels in hand. Him, still swigging from a bottle of Jameson's, bow tie lost in the rose bush beside the graduate's memorial building. Love is a piggyback over a gravelly footpath, a home-cooked breakfast, the whole day spent in bed, with the rose he picked as fresh as the moment he gave it, saved in a makeshift vase between Whitman and Joyce. And this is called Unfurling. The bride must unfurl herself like a peony wilting petals. She must give a petal to her husband, one to her in-laws, two to her parents, saving more for when the hip fractures and solicitor visits require her counsel, her taxi service, her homely help. She will donate countless petals to the children. They will fall unacknowledged on wet concrete, lie trampled, like last year's concert posters. She will slip slide on the confetti of her dreams. The last of the petals, the ones she never intended to shed, the ones she thought about pressing, placing in an envelope as her mother pressed her wedding flowers, gifted them to her scented with lavender to keep her sweet, those petals will not fall. They will grow back into themselves, trying to find the root of the flower that bore them, trying to turn back time. Though they are old now, brittle and brown, rotten and unloved, once their beauty made people reach out with yearning. It is right the bride has changed her name, so different she is now from the flower girl she once was. And this is a poem about motherhood. The dark hours. The dark hours are quiet and free, if I'm careful, I can work between twelve and three. I creep away from his snoring, look in on you, in your Pepto-Bismol pink pig motif jammies riding up around your belly. Consider pulling them down, stop myself. The click on the safety gate at your door seems connected to a switch behind your eyes. They flick open, wide and accusing. I am terrified you'll clock me, scream, be up till four. I've learned through trial and error. Through many lost nights, if I stay still, you might blink two or three times, chew some saliva, turn on your side, let me slink away. Tonight I do not chance it. I whisper my love through a crack in the door, avoid the creaky stare. Hope I am not attracting would-be intruders in a field somewhere out there when I flick on the whole night. I sit at the kitchen table, now clear. I type and read till 3.01. Then set a melamine bowl and beaker where my laptop was. Um, I'm going to read three more poems. The next one is called Long Stone Lower East, and um, it's about um, Long Stone is a place um, in Lisburn, which is in Northern Ireland, and it seemed to me that there were some similarities between Long Stone in Northern Ireland and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. The Williamsburg Bridge starts or ends in the Lower East Side. It is as if the long stone broke from a jigsaw puzzle, floated across the Atlantic and slid in next to FDR Drive. Men loiter outside steaming fried chicken shacks. Women with hair on their chins wheel their wares from huckster stores selling shampoo, mops, chip mugs. Piss-stained pedos wander filthy streets. Shoeless children hang out of buggies they shouldn't need. Bowery boasts more bars, but the same prompt to women to walk quickly, protecting their bags, their bodies, 
watching over their shoulders, treading on tiptoe to muffle their comings and goings even before dusk. A sign, drivers, lock your doors, welcomes Brooklynites to Manhattan. As the RUC warned us on the M1, on the lower falls, on the onslip to the west link, they too reprimanded women for going out at night. Taxi men kept rolling, never quite stopping at red lights. On Clinton Street, there are swimming pools on apartment roofs, cinemas and basements where realtors host viewings. Silk effect marketing booklets boast windows in every room. Exquisite goldfish bowls, sandwiched between vegan cafes and cocktail bars, rise next to New York's answer to Divis Flats. Shit brown, upended matchstick boxes scoring the skyline. Even we had the decency to tear down flats that stacked people like chickens in a van on its way to the burn house. And the final two poems are really about um, um, how women are treated in Ireland, and I'm sure you're aware of the upcoming referendum um, for the repealing of the Eighth Amendment. Um, so this, although there's a lot known about that and about the model in laundries, I don't think there's so much known about something called a symphysiotomy, which was uh, something that used to happen to women when they were pregnant and instead of a caesarean if they needed it, uh, where, they, where they broke women's hips um, in, order, in order to uh, deliver the child, because I believe in the Catholic Church they thought it was less um, irreligious to do it that way than, than to have a C-section. And um, the impact of that psychologically and physically on women is, is not something that is um, commonly discussed or, or really has been covered very much in the news. So this is called Numbers. 129 wombs collected. 1998, the last time they did it, if you could believe them. 25 years, a quarter century, and doctor allowed to keep his position, his power, his pension off to Spain for some rest and relaxation. A hard job wielding a saw on women as they lay, sometimes tied to a bed, screaming, tortured as they bled and bled and bled, not just on the table, but still today, from oceans away, from the darkest corners of their rooms, from the dentist chair, where the scaler makes a sign that takes them back, as the roadworks and the digging up the town takes them back, as the ad on TV for another new horror film takes them back, they are back, not in a back room on their backs, but on the ward for all to watch as they were backed into a corner. Nurses prepped the tools to the tune of a tongue lashing from the doctor who told them move faster. His time was precious. His hands were blessed by the Pope. And now, not able to open their legs wide enough for their husbands, a good hot tea will have to do the trick, haunted by their symphysiotomies. A Celtic Catholic cashmere of chaste ideals playing on loop as they drum their laps, nappy clad under long skirts, castrated for their own good, without consent or any medical rhyme or reason. 2003 at last struck off, but the women in the room, no, only doing their jobs, deferred, prepared for his hands, no blood on them. A sordid history, a rotten, filthy shame, and now we're known for Savita and septic tanks and tomb, and the 5,000 every year who make for England to do what Ireland won't. And still the world will wear green, call us Colleen, on the 17th, and parade on by. And the final poem um, is called Tomb, and it's about the, uh, the mass graves that historian Catherine, Catherine Corliss um, uncovered there of the children. Um, who were the offspring of the women who were in one of the laundries. Tomb. Accepted, suspected, septic, the rotten foundation of how we treat the women who bring forth the next generations. Prison camps, really. Labouring women labour in shame, have their babies taken, renamed. Decades go by and we try to right the wrong, Mark the territory, lay claim to those innocents' lives lost as the 50 and 60-year-old men and women assert she did nothing wrong. She would have been a fabulous mother. And you can see in their watery eyes the scar of grief, a life lived shuttled away from the one who grew them, a dirty secret farmed as from a bitch's litter. 
Lives can be taken in so many ways, and this happened for years and decades, and it happened every single day. Ireland, church and state, allowed that rotten decay, those poor dead babies to lay in that ground, a stain on this nation so profound we can think of no word to sum up the horror except to say tomb, 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 tomb. Thank you. And thank you to all the readers and to Vanessa and Kellogg for hosting us. Thank you.